So um, I guess it's time. So uh, welcome everyone to the plenary session of the PASCO 2021. Uh, this morning, yeah. or this, uh, this evening, uh, we have a uh, uh, very exciting topics and uh, speakers. Uh, so every each talk will be uh, 40 minutes, including Q&A. Uh, if you find the questions, please type in in the Q&A window or simply uh, put a raise your hand and I can give you a mic after the presentation. Okay, so the first speaker is Mariana Safranova from Delaware. Mariana, please. Uh, hello, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I wish it could be in person, but hopefully uh, in the future. I will talk about quantum technologies for new physics discoveries. And uh, in the past 15, 20 years, there have been extraordinary progress in the control of atoms and molecules. So now atoms are now ultra cold at picocalvins. They're trapped and they can be also precisely controlled. So we can entangle atoms, we can manipulate atoms. <clears throat> and uh, the level of precision actually was raised tremendously because of those advances. And that enabled new searches for uh, dark matter, for uh, various new physics. I will very, very briefly give sort of a bird's eye view of various fundamental physics searches with quantum science technologies uh, with atomic and molecular uh, physics. There is a very broad range of different experiments searching for some sort of uh, <clears throat> violations of fundamental symmetries. I will speak, if I have time, a little bit about the searches for electron EDM. Uh, then also there are new efforts in searching for hadronic EDM, to enhance parity violation. And uh, today I will mostly speak about atomic and uh, nuclear clocks and cavities and which fundamental physics searches you can do with them. And then uh, there are many, many other efforts and uh, you uh, may hear some of them on this and other conferences. There is a lot of progress been in atom interferometry, large scale devices, uh, 100, 150 meter devices are being, prototypes are being built for gravitational wave detection. <clears throat> there are many different axioms in various ALP searches. And there are also very many other dark matter new force searches using atomic clocks, interferometry, magnetometry, um, limited optomechanics. There is really, uh, very, very many different experiments. And a lot of that actually happened in uh, the last uh, five uh, or 10 years. If you're interested in those other searches, uh, there are several <clears throat> uh, new sources which you can look at. There is a new report uh, on uh, decadal assessment and outlook for AMO science. And there is a whole chapter six on the precision frontier. This is available freely online. There is a recent review, uh, it was about you know, two, three years ago. And also <clears throat> the most recent new thing, there is a focus in issue in quantum science and technology, specifically on the topic of the stock, but much, much broader uh, range of quantum sensors. And it's called quantum sensors for new physics discoveries. As of now, there are about 13 papers uh, available online, here's the link. And uh, they I think going to be maybe five, uh, five more. So in this uh, huge focus issue and uh, essentially that covers kind of the next generation. Where are we going to go for the next decade with a more quantum sensors for dark matter searches and other new physics. But today I'll mostly speak about the search for new physics with atomic clocks. And atomic clocks can measure and compare frequencies to exceptional precision. And we're talking 18 significant figures at this point. And the basic idea for the new physics effects that if there is some unknown effects which shifts the frequency of the clock and uh, it will most likely actually act differently on different clocks. So you can monitor the ratios of clock frequencies and see whether the, your clock frequency changed or not, your ratio of frequencies changed or not. And that actually allows you to separate new physics effect. And one of the reasons it could work is because the clock systematics have been understood in extremely high level precision. So we do really understand the standard model contribution there to 18 significant figures. Uh, if you ever use a GPS, you use the atomic clocks because GPS is based on atomic clocks, which are on those satellites. And these are very, very old clocks, which are on satellites. And the accuracy is about 0.1 nanosecond. Those are based on microwave transitions in cesium. And the progress with clocks have been tremendous. So the blue line here shows the progress uh, of the GPS type clocks 
microwave clocks based on microwave frequencies. And the red line showed the new progress of new optical clocks. And as you see, it's almost like a more slavish clock. So there's actually incredible precision. And there is no technical reason why we can't progress many orders of magnitude more. Just to put in perspective, what 10 to the minus 18 fraction of frequency uncertainty means that optical atomic clock will not lose one second in more than lifetime of the universe. Those are extraordinary devices. And I will talk a little bit about how clocks work before delving into dark matter searches. The basic idea of a clock is that you need some sort of an oscillator. So atoms are all the same. They will oscillate in exactly the same frequency in the same environment. Those are perfect oscillators. Therefore, they're the perfect references uh, for the clocks. So we'll take a sample of atoms. If we have neutral atoms, generally people use about a few thousand, and that improves statistics a lot. If you have ions, most of ion, all of the ion clocks now operate with one ion, and hopefully we'll get to a few ions. And then what you actually use the atoms or ions for, it's your standard of frequency. So what you also need to do, you need to build a laser, which will be exactly in resonance with your atom or ion. And then what you need to do is count the cycles of the signal. So think about that, uh, do you need the atoms to essentially tune your laser to the right frequency? So in many ways, uh, atomic clock works as tuning instrument. So you have this device uh, <clears throat> to tune an instrument, which uh, <clears throat> has some sort of a standard of frequency. And that standard are your atoms. And this, you know, the guitar is your laser. You're tuning it exactly on resonance with atoms. So what do you actually measure when you have a clock? So you have a laser, you shine your laser at your atoms, and you see whether the atoms did or did not make the transition. So when you actually measure, you measure populations of atoms between levels in zero and one. For technical reasons, you actually put them in a sort of position of zero and one. So all those atoms are 50% um, and zero, 50% and one. And then you uh, make a measurement, see whether if you change the frequency, you get a little more on this side, a little more on that side. And uh, you tune the frequency of your laser until you're perfectly in resonance. You get maximum amount of your atoms excited. And then you count the frequency with another laser, which is called a frequency comb. And uh, <clears throat> it's possible to actually just compare two frequencies independently of any reference just with a frequency comb. So you can actually compare two different clocks to very, very high precision. Here is how the clock actually looks like. I'm a theorist. That's a, a picture from Janice group of strontium uh, Gila clock. And uh, by the way, it kind of looks also like atomic physics quantum computer. It's a very similar type of technology. And the great things about those clocks is they're tabletop devices. OK, there may be few tabletop devices, meaning that uh, maybe there is a frequency comb and a laser and some other table. But technically, it could be actually made portables. And uh, there is enormous effort to make those clock portable. And uh, portable clocks already exist. It's actually fairly high precision as well. Quite a few already constructed because the clocks are constructed uh, for metrology purposes and for many other applications, and that effort will continue regardless of new physics searches. Uh, they will continue to rapidly improve, and eventually we'll get clocks to space. There is already uh, ultra cold, um, one ultra cold uh, cesium clock in space, uh, and uh, this effort will continue. If anyone interested, there's going to be an awesome workshop on that tomorrow. Uh, I can send you the link if you don't have one. Then. There are many applications of atomic clocks. So the, all the new physics searches, it's honestly not what atomic clocks were intended or initially built for. It just turns out they're so good, you can actually look for dark matter with them. And that was a kind of a really great and expected bonus of the clocks. But initially, they were built for the definition of the second. Uh, as a GPS devices, you can actually uh, uh, use them for very long uh, baseline interferometry, they also have really, really good at measuring gravitational potential. So it, as a present accuracy, clocks can tell difference in height to one centimeter, which is incredible. Like literally you have two clocks and one is a centimeter high than the other, you can tell the difference. And then uh, they, as I said, the gravity sensors, you can actually do quantum simulations with them because they are intrinsically quantum technology devices. And then uh, what we're interested in during this talk it searches for new physics beyond the standard model. And just to zoom in uh, which type of new physics searches you can do, you can look if fundamental constants are constant. And that's sort of the first thing which was done with clocks. 
Uh, recently, about uh, six or seven years ago, it's been suggested that dark ultralight dark matter can actually affect the clocks. The bus limit on the violation of rents and various with electrons have been set by clocks. You can actually use the fact that uh, Earth's orbit is elliptical and uh, test the equivalence, uh, equivalence principles, the local position invariance, and there have been new actually proposals to search for gravitational wave detection with clocks. And uh, this list is growing and uh, it'll be very interesting what happens in the next 10 years. And now we'll talk specifically about dark matter. So of course, not all dark matter will affect atomic energy levels, but some will. So what we're interested in is what dark matter, what dark matter scenario uh, you can detect if you can measure changes in atomic nuclear frequencies to 19, 20 digits. And as I've mentioned, the clocks are now just slightly under 10 to the minus 18, but the rapid progress is expected the next order of magnitude probably be in the view of five years. And there is really no technical reason why it can't be 20 digits. And I'll talk a little bit about the nuclear clock in the end as well. Which particular dark matter masses are we sensitive to? Well, we are sensitive to dark matter, which is very light. So here we're in this ultralight town. Most specifically, we're somewhere under uh, 10 to the minus 12 EV. And there is a reason why. There is a characteristic reason of uh, uh, what the atomic clock probe time is, which limits masses to this region. Uh, at high frequency, atomic uh, various equivalence principle, like torsion balances, microscope mission becomes better. Uh, if it's dark matter, that I mean, it should go to about 10 to the minus 22 EV. But if we talk about just some ultralight fields, the, the smaller the mass, the better atomic clocks actually give you the limit for. Clearly, at this point, we are looking for bosonic dark matter. Uh, the fermionic dark matter would uh, escape the galaxy long by that time. And uh, we are looking at a scenario when we have a very large occupational numbers per hour de Broglie volume. So we are not talking about dark matter detection particle by particle. We really here are talking about dark matter detection of a coherent wave. So there are so many dark matter particles per de Broglie volume that scalar dark matter will exhibit coherence and behaves, behaves like a wave. So the basic idea of how dark matter of such kind could affect clocks that you have a dark matter field which will couple to electromagnetic interaction normal matter as it could be linear coupling or quadratic coupling. And then it will make fundamental coupling constants and mass ratios oscillate. Then if that happens, then that automatically means that atomic or nuclear energy levels will oscillate. Therefore, the clock frequency will oscillate. And for atoms, every atomic energy level is proportional to Rydberg constant that has a fine structure constant inside of it. So therefore it actually will be affected, but different clocks will be affected differently. The clocks on based on very light atoms will be actually almost not affected. The ones based on heavy atoms will actually be affected much more significantly. And there are special enhancements in different systems. So what you want to do, you want to monitor the ratio of clocks over time. <laughs> well, how long depends on, well, how much time do you have? So the longer the better. It's also uh, possible to actually monitor a clock versus a cavity and cavity is a part of your laser. And that gives you a different dependence on the fundamental constants just based on the size of your uh, cavity. So how does it work? Let's say you have a dilatonic coupling. So you have a, a coupling of your scalar field directly to your standard model Lagrangian, the linear coupling. You can also make quadratic coupling here. So uh, every part of your Lagrangian will acquire extra terms. For example, your fine structure constant will have a small admixture of the oscillating term, which is just a coupling of your dark matter field of photons. So that's your coupling constant. And then your clock frequency are oscillating. You measure the ratio of clock frequencies and you plot the couplings versus dark matter mass. The important point here is that how good your experiment is also depends which clocks do you have, which pairs of clocks do you use. And those casings are sensitivity factors. We can actually compute very well to actually very high precision. And the great thing about atomic physics, you can calculate things to you know, sub percent level to extremely high precision. And generally we can compute all those atomic sensitivity factors with great accuracy. So we know which clock is sensitive uh, to alpha and which one is not. Uh, in the basic idea of sensitivity factor, if, it's, if your K is 100, then if you measure frequency at 10 to the minus 18, you test alpha or dark matter at 10 to the minus 20. So you get the extra bonus of factor 100. 
how do you actually make measurements? Well, basically you use the clock as you use the clocks. You run the clock for as long as possible, or at least while dark matter is still coherent, which could be say, you know, days to a year. And you make regular measurements during certain time intervals. And this time intervals actually will tell you which time inter in which time interval you tell you actually limits which dark matter masses you can use. And that would put limit on clock masses because the sort of a reasonable probe time, it's well, some of a second, meaning you actually don't talk, to, clock doesn't talk to your laser for about a second. And that's uh, the state of the art. You can actually do a few seconds at this point. You should be able to do maybe a hundred seconds eventually. And you see if the probe time is, ten to the, is one second, so your frequency is one hertz. That dark matter masses is about 10 to the minus 15 range of dark matter masses. Uh, you can uh, very easily drop lower. It's somewhat hard to get actually to higher masses. So at 10 to the minus 12, you already apply actually fast pulses. Your probe time is small. Your sensitivity drops because your statistics is worse. And then all you do, you take the sequence of measurements, and those are normal clock measurements, just uh, you know as long as as fast as possible. And then your detection signal is peak with monochromatic frequency uh, in the discrete Fourier transform of the time series. So you take your time series, you do a discrete Fourier transform, you transform the frequency domain, you should see essentially a peak at the dark matter quantum frequency. And it's also slightly asymmetric just because of the uh, dark matter dispersion. And uh, you can verify it as different clocks. Uh, those searches are intrinsically broadband, but if you actually see the signal, you can do resonance searches with other types of clocks. And uh, this is a confirmable signal. Here are the current status of the experiments for this oscillating dark matter bounds. This is the most recent Jilla strontium clock cavity comparison. And uh, <clears throat> the blues are current limits and the red and the green is project of how much you can improve essentially within uh, your uh, current clock sensitivities. And the question is how do you actually do it much, much better? Because there is a possibility of how to improve those tests by you know, five, seven orders of magnitude from this point. The other idea was, which was suggested of how to actually search for dark matter with clocks is uh, if you have some sort of transient effects, for example, you have dark matter clumps, strings, uh, or the thing which is easier, easiest to actually model would be the main wall. And if those are large enough and frequent enough, and uh, we can talk about how likely that is, then you can actually use a network of clocks. And if your large scale defects go through Earth, you will actually have synchronization and desynchronization of your um, clock network. There been also a recent paper by Evgeny Stadnik, which actually showed that uh, since it's a quadratic interaction, there is a very strong screening and high density environment. And uh, his suggestion was that you, don't that you don't really have to wait even for that domain wall or whatever that is to pass. So there could be just one domain wall anywhere in the uh, universe. What you should actually measure, you should measure environmental dependence of fundamental constants. You, you should look at screening. And if you measure them on Earth and in space, uh, then you can actually see in this scenario some variation of uh, uh, fundamental constants. And that actually would set stronger limits on this type of fields. The other interesting uh, model is the model of relaxion. So relaxion is been suggested to uh, solve the hierarchy problem with cosmological relaxation. So you, in this case, you don't have any high mass TV particles to solve the hierarchy problem. You actually have a light spin zero field, which dynamically relaxes Higgs to mass with respect to his natural. So you start with a large natural value, but then uh, due to the coupling between Higgs and relaxion, the Higgs fields actually end up with uh, what it is right now. As a result, you actually will end up with an extra scalar particle and uh, the nuclear clock, which I'll talk a little bit later, will actually be sensitive to the natural space of the relaxion as well. And that's one very interesting actually model to pursue. And now I'll talk a little bit about fundamental physics with novel atomic and molecular system. And what do I mean by novel? Well, the first quantum sensors we built with devices, uh, built on atoms, which was the easiest to cool and trap. And then includes alkalis, alkaline earth ions, and then uh, slightly later alkaline earth, but not the rest of the periodic system. Just because it, those have the simplest electronic structures, they're easiest to cool, they have stable isotopes, and that's where the first experiments, especially with clocks, came from. 
The reason being because those were things from which you, it was the easiest to build clocks. You had those in the lab and uh, <clears throat> those were selected, of course, not with any regard to specific sensitivity to new physics searches. And now we can actually go from building quantum sensors to really dedicated experiments. Why would we use novel systems? Well, because many of them will have much higher sensitivity to the new physics. And that's what they're going to start seeing in the next decade to move uh, from systems we already have to systems which have the highest sensitivities. For example, there are enhancements in heavy atoms, ions, molecules, the relativistic effects, the deformation nuclei, larger effective fields, what types of EDMs. This is not just for clocks, this is for many, many different types of experiments. So different types of transitions are available. Uh, for example, you can actually have sensitivity to the different fundamental constants. Molecules and molecular ions will have much more sensitivity to mass of electron to mass of the proton ratio. The highly charged ions will have much higher sensitivity to alpha. Nuclear clocks have much, much higher sensitivity to alpha and also sensitivity to uh, nuclear sector as well. In many in, or some of the those searches, you need more than one isotope and sometimes you need to use radioactive isotopes. Uh, for various reasons. So the basic idea is that the new systems have properties which are not available in currently current quantum technologies and they can either allow reduced systematics, better statistics, or much higher sensitivity to new physics. So uh, with we'll, the effort in building better and better quantum sensors will continue, but also with branch off to dedicated new physics experiments. And of course, a number of new physics experiments which were dedicated from the start already been ongoing, such as EDM searches. Now, uh, what neural system can be used for clocks? And here's the reasoning is very simple. What we want, we want a system where you can do precision frequency measurement, meaning you can actually build a clock from them. And you want as high as possible that K factor. And as you remember, the K factor was how sensitive is your clock to variation of uh, fundamental constants. And if you look in all the current clocks on that graph, we actually, or, or that scheme, we have sensitivity to all the current clocks. As you see, most of the clocks are somewhere between zero and one, meaning they're not the, you know, have the greatest sensitivity. For example, any clock to cavity, a strong clock to cavity would be about sensitivity of one. The highest sensitivity for terbium plus, and there is, it's understood why it's the highest sensitivity, it's based on a very different type of transition. And that's where actually the most precision experiments right now come from for alpha variation for drifts. So which other systems we can use? All of the current clocks are either operating with neutral systems or singly charged times. So the other idea is to go to highly charged times. So you take a, you know, you take neutral atom and you tear away one electron and the second electron and the third electron and tear away about 10 electrons and you can called a highly charged ion in this case. And uh, the reason why we actually care is because those systems are much more compact. So every time you tear, tear away the electron, the electronic cloud shrinks. In one of the systems that those are actually quite protected from uh, various perturbations, especially star shifts. So you have reduced systematic, you have rich variety of energy levels. And you may ask like, why haven't we used those before? Well, because no one could pull traps them until very few, uh, until very, very recently. Generally, those systems do not have direct cooling transitions like singly charged ions do. And you can see what actually happens, uh, what interesting differences you have now in your energy levels. If you take a neutron boron, as you see that this is optical, but this is already VUV. The reason why it matters, it's because it's very hard to build lasers in VUV and it's impossible to build lasers further in VUV as of now at least. And now if you actually ionize it, then you actually have a very, very nice optical transition and here you don't have any optical, any good optical transitions to work with. And that optical transition is the one you use, you use for clocks. The problem is there is no cooling transition, but uh, sympathetic cooling techniques have just been developed of how to actually deal with those systems. So now the highly charged science are firmly in the field of quantum technologies again, and we can actually use them for new physics searches. In the, the first experiment, the first cooling of highly charged times was 2015. And the first actual sort of prototype clock, the first precision frequency measurement was just five years later. And just to show you how quickly atomic physics can progress and uh, how much difference does it make to have your iron cold. This is your relative accuracy of the most accurate measurement in highly charged time. And that was about 10 to the minus eight. And the thread button 
that actually where we are right now, just because it is cold. So seven orders of magnitude improvement in frequency, just because it is cold. And this is why those actually are very powerful techniques. And now with already this being about 10 to the minus uh, 15 or so precision, it's actually now possible to build uh, realistic clock systems for those. To summarize, uh, highly charged ions for ultra precise clocks, they have much higher sensitivity of variation of alpha, for example, a factor of about 100. And then uh, there are different type transitions which are available. There is additional enhancement to Lorentz violation searches. And there are also other interesting reasons to use highly charged ions, test of QED, fifth four searches. And uh, the progress is expected to actually be very fast. From experimental groups, they expect in five years, they will reach about 10 to minus 18 accuracy already. And in 10 years, they will reach it for systems which are of particular interest to uh, fundamental physics searches. And now the question is, what about the nuclei? Why do we actually always use those atomic transitions rather than nuclei? Can we use the nuclear transitions to look for variation of fundamental constants in dark matter searches? And well, the answer is the problem that we don't have the lasers. Because the typical nuclear energy transitions are in mega electron volts. There's six orders of magnitude from which where we actually have tabletop lasers from which you can actually build accurate clocks. So see all those blue points, they're all the nuclear transitions and the red points, that's where the clocks are. So you have five orders of magnitude discrepancy here from what we actually can use from what the nuclear transitions are. And the greatest thing, there's one exception. There is a thorium, a thorium to 29 isomer, which is uh, pretty much within the clock energy levels. It's slightly, to, it's a bit to VUV, it's a bit hard to work with, but it's possible. So this one is already uh, higher in terms of the frequency, it may be eventually be possible. But for now, we only have one, one, just one nuclear on which you can potentially build a clock, no. How does it actually work? In this case, we have a transition not between atomic energy levels, but between the nuclear ground state and nuclear isomer. And remarkably, the transition is 150 nanometers. And uh, that is your one exception. This is a very narrow transition. That's a great clock to build. 150 nanometer is very hard to build laser, but already possible how to actually build lasers 150 nanometers. So the only problem is that people still, people have seen the isomer, it's, it's, it's proven to exist. The energy levels has been measured, energy has been measured, but no one yet actually laser excited it, but that should happen actually very shortly. Why do we want the nuclear clock? Well, besides, it'd be very cool just to excite the nuclear transition with a laser. And there are many other interesting um, possibilities which you can then use it for. And, uh, but the main reason you want it, that will be an extraordinary device to actually test fundamental physics. Because here we have transition, which is EV, but characteristic difference of Coulomb energies of those two states, the ground state and the isomer should be an MEV. So we expect a factor of 10 to the five enhancement for your variation of alpha or variation uh, of uh, quark masses to lambda QCD. And uh, it's expected in the five years to be a prototype of nuclear clocks and expected in 10 years it would actually be high precision nuclear clocks. So again, here is a, this enormous effort which is devoted toward building nuclear clocks and uh, hopefully this will happen shortly. And in the remaining couple of minutes, I will talk a little bit about novel, syst novel systems for the EDMs. So time reversal variance must be violated for elementary particle to possess the permanent EDM. And the reason why we care is because we need new sources of CP violation to explain matter antimatter asymmetry. For example, supersymmetry will produce a, bit, uh, a new CP violation. And uh, one of the ways to look for it and for any of those TV scale physics is to look for electron and other EDMs. Electron EDM, it's a, the most straightforward signature. If you see electron EDM, it's new physics. The standard model signal is extremely weak. And here is a recent picture by Dave DeMille uh, of how those experiments progressed. And there've been a factor of 10 improvement uh, from uh, past five years and another five years. And uh, we know, people know how to improve those experiments by several orders of magnitude. And with polyatomic molecules, you can improve them even more. So there are three major uh, ongoing efforts. Uh, here, there is uh, ACME, which is uh, really one of the most advanced experiments. And they, all of those experiments probably see 
uh, expected order of magnitude improvement, uh, hafnium fluoride plus, which is uh, thorium fluoride plus, and Imperial College uh, also turbine fluoride. So those experiments ongoing, they will improve by another order of magnitude. But you can actually improve much, much more by many orders of magnitude if you use laser-cooled molecules, which also have combinatometry states. So if you can actually put cold molecules in a lattice. So technology is nearly there. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> had been demonstrated for the, uh, these different molecules, but the idea is that you actually need polyatomic molecules. It's because you cannot laser cool the atomic molecules with common atomic states. And uh, uh, very interesting effort is collaboration between- uh, Mariana, five minutes. Yes. Okay, I'm almost, actually I'm almost done. Okay. Uh, it's a collaboration uh, uh, with um, Nick Huxter and John Doyle. And uh, the idea there is to use actually triatomic molecule terbium H, which will be perfect for the DM measurement. You can both do laser cooling and you can reject the systematic effects here uh, with those commonitometry levels. And hopefully this is totally new technology. Hopefully there'll be new DM results from that uh, experiment in a, you know, half a decade and much improvement in the uh, next decade and so. So the atomic clocks have, have great potential for discovery of new physics the many, many new development coming in the next 10 years. And uh, uh, despite the fact that we already been developing quantum sensors for the past you know, couple of decades, we really just barely started. So there are many, many new things coming, uh, measurement beyond the quantum limit, for example, uh, measurement with novel systems. And what we need, we need really more ideas uh, also from the particle physics community and cosmology, how to use quantum sensors and quantum technologies for new physics searches. Uh, in the future, it'd be interesting to see quantum sensors in space and there are many other things you can measure with them in space. And uh, I would like to thank you all for <clears throat> attention and acknowledge uh, our collaborators in our group. And I would like to mention that uh, I expect a postdoctoral position in the new physics searches with quantum technology. So I'm actually looking not for atomic physics, but for particle physics postdoc. So if you're interested, please uh, let me know. Thank you so much. So thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, time for the question or comments. If you have a question, please raise your hand or type in, in the Q&A. Okay, while we are waiting, I was just curious I mean, if you find some deviation or the signals in your atomic physics experiments, uh, what could be the source of that besides the dark matter? Well, uh, first, uh, it's kind of convenient to talk about new particles and new physics in terms of dark matter. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be dark matter. It, it, I mean, it, what you will see, you will see some new physics signals. So if it's actually uh, seen in clocks, then what you will know, you will know the mass of the new particle and the coupling. So you will know whether it, uh, which sector will couple, depending on which clock you're looking for. Uh, it doesn't have to be dark matter. It could be some unknown new particle. On the other hand, what you can actually look, uh, you can look for violation of Renzi variance, and that's a very specific signal. And this has to be periodic with some very specific periodicity, so you can separate this one. You can look for anomalous redshifts, especially with new ideas for clock and space. And that, how to interpret that already, uh, also, it could couple, it could be a coupling between your uh, fundamental constants and uh, gravitational potential. And that could be dark matter, but could be some, uh, some other things. Uh, there have been actually a lot of new experiments uh, in atom interferometry, which have been looking specifically for dark energy scenarios. And they set very strict lim limit on chameleon, chameleon, for example, fields. And uh, then what do you think you can do? You can look for gravitational waves. Uh, and uh, right now, the new prototypes which are being built for atom interferometry, they are not going to be sensitive to look for gravitational waves, but they will be sensitive to ultralight particles. And also you can look for new forces. So there are some ideas, for example, if you have some sort of additional short range interaction, you can actually see it with atoms as well. For example, you can see nonlinearities in kink plots, uh, some sort of sporadic transient effects uh, from different sources, people look in them for magnetometry. So there's really a very wide range of things people look for. Of course, there is a very large effort just specifically looking for axions and specifically QCD-like axions. Uh, and, but that's a very well understood parameter space. So if you see something there, you can identify this. But the great thing about clocks is that uh, in 10 years from now, if you have a nuclear clock, we have a molecular clocks, we have bad atomic clocks, we could actually separate couplings to different sectors, to the electromagnetic sector, to the electron sector, to the proton uh, sector, and that allows you to actually see various couplings. For example, you can see something in one, but not the other. Okay. 
any other questions? Please raise your hand. So which one do you think will be the like ultimate winner, like atomic clock or molecular nuclear? Uh, they're different. Uh, if the nuclear clock, uh, I, I think if you build a nuclear clock and the sensitivity is as high as expected, there is actually some uh, uncertainty of what sensitivity is. I think that will actually be the highest chance to actually see a new physics signal, just because you have a potential improvement about 10 to the five. I mean, it's a factor of, you know, 10,000. And uh, uh, this is, of course, difficult because, well, we, we haven't even been able to laser excited yet. So there is, uh, uh, but there is a very, very clear plan. Actually, um, I am part of this ERC Thorium co uh, collaboration. And uh, uh, I think that that will be done. So it's technologically is most, uh, most definitely uh, possible to do it. So, and that just because we have the highest sensitivity, uh, the question is, uh, I, I think the important thing is to look for a large variety of experiments. So the DM experiments are also very, very interesting as well. So uh, I think if one experiment can see new physics in five years, there'll probably be an idea from a quantum technologist. I see, great, thank you. Um, if there is no more questions, so, um, well, thank you again for the very nice talk. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. So uh, maybe we can move on to the next speaker. Um, Ruben, can you put your slides? Uh, yeah, great. Okay, can you see that? Okay, yeah, great. So, well, the next speaker is Ruben Asik from Stony Brook. And Ruben, please. Okay, so thanks very much. So, um, so it's really um, very happy for the invitation. Thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some recent progress on searches for sub-GV dark matter. And in particular, what I mean is uh, between milli-EV and, and the GV scale. Um, so this is a topic that has received a lot of attention over the last few years. And I wanted to share some recent progress. I'm going to have to be selective, of course, in terms of what I discuss, but um, I'm going to just you know, focus on a few highlights, I think. Um, so here's the outline. So I'm going to start with some overview of some of the recent progress. I'll focus on both theory progress and experimental progress. And then I will discuss um, sources and implications of low energy backgrounds. And I'll tell you why this is interesting to think about for low mass dark matter direct detection. And if there's time, I actually don't think there will be, but if there's time in the end, I'll talk about uh, diurnal modulation of sub-GV dark matter. So let's start with, with a broad overview. So just to set the stage, um, so I'm gonna talk about dark matter particles that are heavier than what uh, Mariana was talking about a few minutes ago. And in particular, so here's the dark matter mass scale from milli V up to a TV here. So up here, we've got weakly interacting massive particles. So Rick gave a very nice talk, uh, I think it was yesterday. Um, uh, he actually talked more than more about more than just WIMPs, but he, he focused on WIMPs um, and showed great progress in searches searching for that. What I will focus on is on lower dark matter masses. So we've got um, in general, there's many possible models that can live below uh, the GV scale. So in general, you know, we usually refer to these as hidden sector dark matter particles. So it has to be some particle that interacts with with um, the standard model. Um, with new mediators, so light mediators. Uh, can't be some heavy mediator, but typically they're, they're relatively light. And there's two regions that we're interested in. So there's the dark matter scattering region between about a kV and upwards. Um, so at a kV energy scale, so, so a dark matter particle with a kV mass has a, a kinetic energy of about a milli eV, and that's the lowest energy you can imagine exciting you know, in a single particle interaction in, in some system, like exciting a phonon. So below KV, it's, it's, we can't really think of probing dark matter by scattering. And what we want to do is we want to probe both nuclear and electron interactions to really figure out what the type of mediator, what type of mediator might be. And there's several ways to produce dark matter with the correct relic abundance in these kind of scenarios. And theories have been very busy. And I think Josh in his talk talked about some of them recently, and he's done a lot of work on this uh, recently. Uh, but I've just listed some keywords. You know, you can get the right relic abundance from freeze out, asymmetric from some initial asymmetry from freeze in, or from um, strongly interacting massive particles, 
for uh, also elders, and there's others as well. So below the scale, between about a milliv and a kV, we can think about dark matter being absorbed by uh, an electron, for example, in your system. So the, in this case, the whole mass energy of the dark matter gets converted into energy of, for example, the electron that, that you're getting absorbed, that, that's doing the absorbing. And uh, this allows you to, again, probe down to milliv energies. So this milliv to kV range, we can probe with uh, absorption. Now, there's been significant progress in probing low mass dark matter. So on the theory side, we now have quite a number of detection concepts uh, using a variety of the target materials. We also have improved calculations of how dark matter behaves in uh, these various systems. And there's still you know, much work that needs to be done there. And we also have an improved understanding of low energy backgrounds. And I'll, I'll discuss this. I'll briefly summarize the first two in the next few minutes. And then this one, the third point I'm gonna discuss in, in sort of the second part of the, of the talk. So we have many detection concepts now. So in particular, here's a plot I'm showing from a Department of Energy in the US uh, Commission report. Um, which is a plot, so this is a figure that I made, which summarized the various ideas that exist. It's slightly outdated, but uh, the various ideas exist at the time for probing dark matter scattering down to KV masses. Here I'm looking at nuclear couplings, so that's sigma sub n as a function of the dark matter mass. And you see a lot of lines here, and you know, there's a lot of ideas. So there's using superfluid helium, looking for phonons and light. And if you're sensitive to single phonons, you can even go much, much lower in mass. Uh, we have molecular targets, molecular gas targets, or um, you know, uh, liquids also. We've got um, various semiconductors and um, uh, gaseous targets here. We have polar materials. And there's a lot of ideas that theories have developed and calculations people have done. Uh, and here I'm just showing another example where, so on the left side, I have a mediator with nuclear interactions. On the right, there's an electron mediator, electron coupling of an the coupling of, of the dark to an electron with an ultralight mediator. And we see various ways, uh, constrained parameter space, and then lots of open parameter space we can probe. And some of the models that I mentioned on um, the previous slides about how to get the right relic abundance, they're sort of highlighted here with these key mouse some of the orange regions. But of course, they're not, there's other models one can think about. And then bosonic dark matter absorption. So here we go from about, so this plot goes to 10 milli EV uh, up to 100 EV, and you see again various ideas. So there's a lot of ideas out there um, and they're at various stages of being realized. I think the main concepts that are currently being used to probe dark matter well below the GeV mass. So with the polygon actions uh, are the following two. So there's dark matter electron scattering where we think about scattering the dark matter particle of an electron either in an atomic system or in a crystal, like in a semiconductor in silicon, for example. In the semiconductor and silicon, you would want to excite the electron across the band gap from the from the valence band to the conduction band that requires about one EV of energy. And also for dark matter nuclear interactions, there is the uh, Migdal effect, which was pointed out in a very nice paper by these authors here, where the idea is that you hit the nucleus and then as the nucleus recoils, the electron cloud takes some time to catch up and there's some chance of ionizing an atom. And a similar effect you can actually also get in crystal. But the nice thing about these two effects is that this actually allows for and transfer allows the energy transfer of an order one amount of the dark matter kinetic energy. So unlike nuclear elastic scattering, which is sort of the traditional WIMP probe, um, they, in that case, there's very little energy that gets transferred to the recording nucleus. And it's very hard to measure below, for dark matter masses below, you know, much below the GeV scale. But in these two cases, you actually have an order one amount of the dark matter kinetic energy that can be transferred. So a 500 kV particle, has a kinetic energy of about an EV. Um, you know, if you take a, the maximum dark matter velocity and the escape velocity, and in that case, you can excite an electron in, in silicon across the band gap. So you can probe down to 500 kV if you can measure that resulting electron. Um, now, the typical signal that you get from both of these processes is that it typically produces one or one to a few electrons. And just to show that on the, the actual spectrum, so here's a spectrum of dark matter electron scattering on, the, on, on this plot here. Um, I'm showing the number of events as a function of the number of electrons that are produced in your, this system. So what we're doing is, we are, this is for silicon. So we are hitting, uh, the dark matter hits an electron in the silicon. That electron that got struck can get excited to the conduction band. And depending on how high it gets excited in the conduction band, um, it can actually 
produce additional electron hole pairs as it uh, sort of you know uh, loses its energy. So um, that initial electron can actually produce multiple electron hole pairs. So that's why you see a spectrum where it goes out to to you know, in this case eight electrons. Um, and I am picking you know, 10 MeV for the dark matter, some particular cross section that is actually not that important. What you see here is that there's a sharply folding spectrum, and most of the events are actually lying at this low energy region. So what you need is really a detector that's sensitive to you know, one electron, ideally, uh, you know, two, three, that, that's also good, but really one electron hole pair. Uh, and if you have a detector that's only sensitive to you know, five, six, you can see that you're missing out a lot on a lot of the potential dark matter signals. Now, calculating these rates is actually very challenging in, uh, in a crystal because the electron is part of a many body interacting system. So it's actually not that easy to calculate this accurately. Um, and we've done this in the past and more recently in the last few months, um, uh, there have been several groups that have improved these calculations in various ways. So there's been very nice theory work where the dark matter electron scattering rates have been related to the dielectric function of the crystal, which is in principle measurable or calculable uh, also. And uh, there's also the uh, people have improved the crystal form factor calculation for general dark matter interactions here after showing sort of a massless mediator. Uh, but people have done anapole moments and, and magnetic dipole moments and so on also. And also people have included all the electrons instead of just the valence electrons, which is uh, what previous work has done. So there's a lot of progress in that, which is of course good because you want to make accurate predictions for the experimentalists to look at. And then on the other hand, also there's the dark matter nucleus scattering probe uh, through the Migdal effect where you also produce electrons. And here's a spectrum for germanium and silicon, these two lines, which was calculated by a group um, that I'm highlighting here, um, where they, uh, so this calculation is actually more complicated than in atoms. So in, in crystals, this is more complicated than in atoms because the, um, you know, the nucleus is not a free body. It's actually part of, it sits in a potential and you need to take this into account properly. And, and this group did a, did a great job in terms of calculating these Expected the expected spectra, um, at least down to you know, dark matter masses of several tens of them maybe. There's still more work to do there as well, but there's, a, there's been great progress. Now, experimentally, what, what do we care about? So again, I've already said it, but in both cases, we have a sharply rising spectrum towards lower energies. So the single or few electron sensitivity is really crucial in terms of probing and capturing more potential dark matter events. So we needed experiments that are sensitive to single electrons or, or two electrons or so. And that, of course, is where a lot of the progress has happened as well. So there's been significant experimental progress. So now we have actually multiple technologies that can measure the small ionization signals. Uh, some of them have actually been around for a long time. Uh, so in particular, Xenon 10, you see here is listed. So this is an experiment that ran in 2006, roughly, um, which uh, you know, was sensitive to single electrons. And of course, been, there's been lots of follow-up. And, and I think Rick also mentioned this in his talk uh, yesterday. So we've got xenon, argon, two-phase TPCs, which can measure this. We also have a lot of progress in terms of phonon heat sensors, where um, experiments like Super CDMS, Edelweiss, Crest, and a future proposed experiment called Tesseract can, can probe dark matter below the GV scale. And then also skipper CCDs, uh, such as Sensei, Damagem, and Oscura. So I'm a theorist, but I'm also on Sensei, on the Sensei experiment. So I'll briefly look at these two, uh, the first two bullet points. I want to briefly mention how this technology works. And then I'll talk a bit more about skipper CCDs that we use in Sensei. So um, actually one way that I like to sort of show the exciting experimental progress is by showing a plot from um, 2012 where the first limits on sub-GV dark matter would arrive, first direct detection limits on sub-GV dark matter would arrive. So here I'm showing a limit that we were able to derive from Xenon 10 data that I just mentioned from, you know, that was taken back in 2006. Here's a particular, uh, Friesen, this is the Friesen line. So along this, in this parameter region, along this line in parameter space, you can get the right radical abundance from Friesen for um, this kind of dark matter particle that couples to a light dark photon. And this was the limit in 2012. And now we have a, the same plot on the same scale. You see lots of different lines that have been filling in over the last few years. And uh, there's uh, Sensei, which I'll talk about more, that had three results. Uh, xenon 10, that's the old Xenon 10 limit here, but dark side 50, Xenon 100, Edelweiss, Damic, and CDMS have all had results that probe sub -GB dark matter. And of course, all these are basically prototype detectors. You know, there's also Xenon 1 ton, that's not a pro prototype detector, of course, that's the, they've been doing great work with. 
um, also looking for elephant recoils besides all the great work we do with WIMP searches. But they, um, otherwise these are you know, mostly, these are basically um, prototype detectors. Uh, DAM is also an experiment that um, has been running for a while. So, and here's for a heavy mediator, so a similar plot. Uh, depending, of course, on the dark matter particle, you want to have different kinds of experimental probes. So here, for example, Xenon 1 ton does really great above you know, 10 uh, to 20, 30 MeV or so, where it's the best constraint on dark matter electron scattering for a heavy mediator. And then Sensei, again, takes over at, the, at lower masses. Now, just to show this technology briefly, uh, schematically, you know, I'm, I'm sweeping a lot of details under the rug, of course, which is okay for this talk, I think, but just to give a flavor, there's a lot of um, work that goes into making these things work. But uh, there's the two-phase TPCs, the time projection chambers. So we've got xenon argon liquids, xenon argon, or argon gas, so one of the two elements, and photomultiply tubes on the top and the bottom. There's an electric field across this, and the idea is that as the dark matter comes in, it's the xenon, it's an electron in the xenon or an argon liquid uh, and bounces off. It creates an electron, for example, or a few electrons. Those get pulled by the electric field and then they produce scintillation light in, in the gas phase here uh, as it bounces against the atoms. And those photons are then detected. And it produces a lot of scintillation light. So an electron is actually pretty easy to, de to detect. <clears throat> and this is used by you know, xenon 10, 101 ton and dark side in terms of setting the limits that I showed on the previous slide. Another thing that we that people have done are uh, phonon or heat sensors. So here again, very schematically, I'm showing a silicon or germanium target with an electric field across it. I'm showing schematically a calorimeter, like a transition net sensor, <clears throat> at the bottom and the top here. And again, the dark matter will come in, hit an electron in the silicon target, excited the conduction band, create a, create a couple of electrons potentially, and then those electron holes that you create. They get uh, pulled by the electric field, the electrons go up, the holes go down, and they will, as they bounce across through the lattice, they will generate phonons, uh, generate heat, and that can be detected. And that's, for example, done by super CMS and Edelweiss in terms of the limit that they received, that, that I showed um, previously on the slide. Now, um, one can push this technology to its limit, like the transition edge sensor technology, for example. And there's a proposed project. So I'm not part of this project, but I thought I would, I would highlight it because it's a, it's a very nice uh, project. So um, it's called Tesseract, Transition Edge Sensors with Sub-EV Resolution and Cryogenic Targets. So the idea is to use multiple targets. So in particular, they're thinking about using sapphire, gallium arsenide, and liquid helium. And um, depending on the particular target, so in sapphire, for example, you might produce a phonon as the dark matter hits an electron or the dark matter hits a nucleus. In gallium arsenide, you might produce a photon um, or a phonon as well. And in liquid helium, you might produce uh, phonons or rotons, which can then um, also be detected. And the idea is to detect these particles with uh, uh, TES, transition net sensor technology. And uh, the R&D for this is funded by the US Department of Energy. Um, and you know, if, if all that goes well, it'll be pushed forward to the project stage. Um, and the idea is to probe your dark matter down to MEV scale in, in principle. Um, and there's some more information and, and the figure I also took from this document that I listed at the bottom here. So let me now get to the, the skipper CCDs, <clears throat> the other technology that I want to highlight. So in Sensei, so here I'm showing a skipper CCD that we have in Sensei. So uh, this is about two centimeter by 10 centimeter big. So it's a CCD, it's a charge coupled device. The idea is that you expose the CCD, it creates, it, it um, produces some electrons in an image, and then you read that out. Just to give you the scale, so this is a dime in the US here, and that's the size of the detector, so they're not very big. But this has about 5.4 million pixels. Okay, so the CCD is a slab of silicon about 675 micrometer thick, and it's divided into pixels about, you know, in this case, 5.4 million pixels. And the idea is that in each of these, that, that you can basically divide the CCD into quadrants. Okay, so four quadrants here. And each of the corners, there is a readout where you can measure the charge. And the idea is that you create some, uh, you expose the CCD, you produce some charge, and then you read it out. So you take all the charge and transfer the charge to the one of these corners. So for example, let's take the quadrant three. Here's a readout at the bottom. So you push all the charge down, and at the bottom, you push it to the right. And then here, you can think of having a little capacitor. So if you put some charge on the capacitor, you can measure a voltage. So you measure that voltage. So let's say you've got some charge here, you measure the voltage. And then the nice thing with a 
skip a CCD as opposed to a CCD is that you can repeatedly measure the same charge multiple times without, you know, non-destructively, without losing any charge. So you just flip the charge back and forth, and each time you make a measurement, and by repeatedly measuring a charge and then taking the average of all your measurements, you can, can achieve sub-electron readout noise. And that was demonstrated um, in 2017. Now these CCDs are, the skipper CCDs are uh, designed at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and fabricated at a company called Teledyne Delsa Semiconductor. Um, and they are sensitive to single electrons. Okay, so we can really resolve uh, single electrons. We can resolve events with two electrons, three, four, up to a thousand, right? It just keeps going. We can resolve uh, every pixel precisely how much charge in, is in each pixel by just doing this repeated measurement. Now we've used those CCDs, both prototypes and science grade skipper CCDs to um, package them and put them in a detector underground at Fermilab. So about hundred meters underground near where the Minos detector is sitting. So we call this the Minos hall. Um, so here's the Nova detector, here's the sensor tent. And inside the tent, you see a little detector. Well, you see a little vessel with some lead bricks around it here, about hundred meters underground. And inside here, there's the CCD, just a single one. And we took some data with that. And last year, well, actually the last three years, we've been able to publish results with either prototypes or science grade or science grade skipper CCD. And uh, so here I'm giving just the archive numbers, but those are the leading results for dark matter interacting with a light meter coming scattering through an electron. So just that you know tiny little device, just because it has the sensitivity uh, to be sensitive to single electrons, we're able to get the strongest constraints at the moment. Uh, on on a wide variety of masses and and in this case even you know the entire masses you know over many orders of magnitude. So of course this is just um, you know this is we're learning a lot and the idea is now to put a lot of CCDs together to build up mass. So those CCDs are very light; they're about two grams only in mass. We of course want to have you know much more mass to build up exposure. So right now with Sensei we are installing um, at Snow Lab an underground mine in Canada, about 100 grams of this. So we'll build up to 100 grams. There's also a plan, uh, you know, and this should hopefully be happening 2021. So COVID, of course, has delayed everything, but, you know, we're hoping that by the end of this year, we'll have a decent amount of mass and can take data. And uh, there's also plans by the Damic M collaboration, which plans to put together about a kilogram of skipper CCDs and start data taking in 2023 in Modan. Um, and then there's also an R&D funded effort. So this is uh, funded by the, by the Department of Energy as well. The R&D for this is funded of putting together a project called the SCURA where we would use 10 kilograms of skipper CCDs. And if you run that for three years, you know, 30 kilogram year exposure, you get this sensitivity that I'm showing you in the blue line. And you can really see it's, it's not just incremental improvement, it's really enormous improvement, orders of magnitude improvement that we can get with this. So there's really rapid progress in probing many hidden sector dark matter models. And you know, I'm just showing one particular model here. I, I, I have some plots also for absorption, uh, you know, dark photon absorption and other particles, but uh, in the backup, I'm not gonna show them right now. Okay, so that, those, that was a very rough, or very quick summary of the various technologies. Now, if I think about the big picture, you know, the challenges ahead for low mass direct detection. So there's been a lot of progress in the last few years, but there's clearly a lot to do because most detectors are tiny. You know, we want to build up. And over the next few years, there's at least, I think, you know, five major goals. And I'm just going to list them here in, in some random order. So I think as a theorist, you know, we need to sharpen the theory predictions. And I'm not just talking about the calculations that I mentioned, like the dark matter electron scattering calculations, the fundamental interaction. But, you know, once you excite an electron, we are dealing with processes at the lowest energy scales, and these are not well measured. And just calculating them properly to really understand how many electron hole, hole pairs does the initial electron create, given that it has some, you know, begin, some, prime, some, some recall energy to begin with. We don't know the answer really properly for that. And there's many, many similar cases that I, many other cases that I can mention for, for other systems where we need to calculate the, the theory much more precisely. Now, experimentalists don't just like calculations. They also want to calibrate uh, the signals that you might get and also want to calibrate the backgrounds. So that's very important, of course. We want to, you know, as I already said, we want to increase the target mass of proven detector technologies. Like, for example, the skipper CCD. You know, we've had one CCD operating where we've presented dark matter limits on. We need to prove that we can actually, and, and show that we can actually increase the mass and deal with all the 
complications that come with that. Uh, and then there's, of course, a lot of effort to lower the energy thresholds to probe even lower dark matter masses. So, you know, the skipper CCDs, for example, go down to an MEV mass scale for scattering, down to EV masses for absorption. We want to go, you know, two or three orders of nitrate lower if we can. And that requires building even sens more sensitive devices, like more sensitive transition net sensors. And then finally, um, we will need to understand and characterize and mitigate low energy backgrounds. And this is the, the topic that I want to um, discuss probably my remaining time today. So I probably won't get to this, as I said, but I wanna now just discuss about some of the backgrounds and some of the implications, which are not just for uh, direct detection actually, but in, in other, you know, for other situations, for other uh, levels of implications for quantum uh, superconducting qubits um, and also neutrino searches. So let me um, set the stage. So there's a very interesting uh, fact, which is that all the low mass direct detection experiments that I showed you know, on a few slides ago with on this plot where we have so many limits from right now, in the last few years, they all see an excess of low energy events, events that are not explained by standard radioactive backgrounds. Okay. So for example, in Sensei, we, um, here's a, the spectrum of Sensei. So this is the measured, here's the number of pixels as a function of the charge that we measure in each of those pixels. So we measure a lot of pixels with no charge. That's why you see a big bump at zero. There's some finite width, some Gaussian finite with some finite width here because we do have some readout noise. Uh, depends The readout noise depends on how many times we sample. So we didn't sample that many times to get these narrower, but this is, you know, we can clearly see uh, all the pixels with zero electrons. And here are pixels with one electron and here are pixels with two electrons. So we have about five two electron events, a lot of, you know, about a thousand one electron events. In super CDMS, in the in the in the high voltage detector uh, from last year in that data, you also see a lot of uh, events with two electrons, three, four, five, six, etc. And the origin of these events is a mystery, or has been a mystery for several years. And I say several years, so this data is from last year, but even before that, these events were there. We saw them in in, pre, in proto, proto sensei. They're not understood. And there's other experiments that have backgrounds but I'm going to just focus on these two. Now, this is very strange. We see this rising background. Uh, here, we basically have nothing at three and four uh, and five going out. Uh, there's a two, couple of two electron events and then an enormous number of one electron events. What is their origin? What, 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 where do they come from? Uh, radioactive backgrounds, like from Compton scattering, those we actually expect to be flat. You know, and also with Sensei, we had so little exposure that we don't actually expect a Compton scattering background in that tiny exposure that we had. Uh, so now, but however, in the last year, we've believed that we've identified the likely origin of these excesses, at least at Sensei and Super CDMS, we have an explanation for them. So this is in a paper that I wrote with uh, two uh, fantastic post postdocs, Peggy Du and Daniel Agano Grinovich, and a fantastic student, uh, Muku Shulaburka, and in this paper that I've given the archive number here. Now, why should you care about backgrounds, right? So I'm a theorist, why do I care? Well, okay, because if we can understand these events and remove them potentially, then we have much greater sensitivity at lowest masses. So this at the lowest masses, this sensitivity is directly set by the number of one electron events we see. And here the sensitivity is set by the number of two electron events we see. And also the buildup of one electron events might leak into you know, producing three and four electron events occasionally. Um, but also, you know, so far we've just had these these small detectors, what we want to do is we want to build a 10 kilogram detector eventually, not just a two gram detector. We want to run that 10 kilogram detector for a year or two or three, and not just for a month. So if there's so many one electron events, we're going to be in trouble. So, so the we really need to understand these things. And that's why, of course, it's important to, to think about this. Um, now I show here an image for, for Sensei. So uh, just to sort of show what these one electron events look like in an image, so remember, all these are sensor has lots of pixels. So here I'm just showing part of an image that sensor reads out. So you can see lots of particles. So all these white, all the white uh, things are charged, are measured electrons, uh, are, are electrons measured in the CCD. So here's actually an electron track. Here's an X ray that was absorbed. Here's a muon that goes through the detector, nice straight line. But all these sprinkles that you see, those are one electron events. And you see that they're all over the CCD. There, there are really a lot of them. Um, and what we see from the sensor data is actually a very interesting observation that these one electron events, 
they're not, they can't be dark matter because they actually correlate in position with the high energy tracks. So the closer we go to the tracks, like closer we go to this muon track, the more one electron events we see. Now it's not obvious from this picture, um, but you, know, you can statistically uh, analyze this, of course, or do and, and make different, you know, look at this in more detail, and that's what you see. So that's clearly not dark matter related, but it suggests that the tracks are causing these one electron events, but we don't know why. We, we, there was no obvious mechanism before for what's causing them really. And also we saw that the rate is correlated with the shield thickness. So the, the higher we make the shield, the thicker we make the shield, the fewer high energy background events we have, and also the fewer one electron events we have. That's something else we noticed. Now we thought about this and we realized that uh, there's actually new sources of low energy events that are very standard uh, physics processes, but they just have been neglected by, the, by, the, by this community. Uh, and in particular, what we realized is that the radioactivity and also the cosmic ray muons, they can actually produce many photons that are of order energy or order 1 EV scales. And those uh, photons can be produced either from Cherenkov radiation. So as a particle goes through your um, any through any dielectric material, like through your silicon or through your holders, you can actually emit Cherenkov radiation, a lot of order EV photons. Or, so here I'm showing a, a schematic. Here's a vessel with a detector and some holders here and here's some cable. And when a high energy particle goes through, it can emit Cherenkov radiation as it interacts in the detector itself or in the holders. And, or as it goes from one surface to another, it can emit transition radiation. And those photons can get absorbed in the sensors then in the detector to produce an electron. Um, and you know, there's a lot of tracks that sensor has, so, and sensor operated only 100 meters on the ground. So we have about 100, gra 100 tracks per gram day of exposure at sensei. At super CDMS HV, the data they showed, they have about, they were operating on the surface, so they have about 10,000 tracks per gram day. Um, and the other thing we pointed out is that whenever you've got a track, high energy particle going through some material, it's gonna produce electron hole pairs, and those can sometimes radiatively recombine and produce photons. They can also sometimes recombine and produce phonons. Uh, that's also back onto potential phonon detectors, but they can also produce photons. And um, now if you look at this in detail for Sensei, what we've realized is that the one electron events that we see are likely dominated by Cherenkov and radiative recombination. So here's a picture of the CCD module. Um, here's a, on the right side is a schematic thing. Uh, so here's the skipper CCD, 675 micrometer thick. It's glued with some epoxy here. So it's some glued to some other piece of silicon, which has a fancy name of pitch adapter. And it sits in this copper box. And what happens is that uh, as the charged particle goes through, they can produce trunk of radiation. Now, most of those photons that you produce, they will not travel very far. But if you produce photons that are very close to the band gap of silicon, they can actually travel very far. And the closer you are to the band gap, the further they can travel. And that explains the correlation with the high energy tracks. So here's the number of photons that are produced as a function of the length they can travel or on the top axis as a function of the energy. And the closer you are to the band gap, um, uh, you know, 1.2-ish EV or so, uh, the further they can travel. And um, that's of course a reduced chance that they're close to the band gap. So you get the higher chance that you're closer to the initial track. Um, and that, you know, you can do simulation and you find that that actually fits the data reasonably well. Uh, and also, you know, we pointed out that this, there's a tiny little thin layer of highly doped silicon on the backside of the CCD where you can have a high chance of radiative recombination once you produce an electron hole pair there from some charge track. And that can also produce uh, photons. So, you know, now we're doing a detailed simulation, but the idea is to, to look at this and, um, to really understand uh, whether that issue is the complete explanation or not. And for super CMS, I'll just be very quick. So we have a similar kind of detector. They actually have some um, silicon dioxide, some, you know, some glassy material, some fiberglass material inside the detector. And whenever you've got track going through, we can also produce many photons. And we can actually also fit their data reasonably well with some, some reasonably simple model. Okay. So, um, now, what are the implications? So do I, do I have more, three more minutes or two more minutes? Uh, uh, you can have like five minutes. Okay, yeah, I won't take that long, but okay, thank you. Okay, so what are the implications of this? So there's, there's a few. So first of all, all the 
uh, you know, basically all experiments that people use, they have some dielectric material, right? You've got colders, you need cables, and so you need a very careful evaluation of the background. So these are very common materials in your detector. And this is important for you know, all the experiments that I've already mentioned, Sensei, Damage, Moscura, Super CDMS. Um, people had ideas of using optical heliscopes uh, and various targets, and that's all important. It's even important potentially for Super CDMS Snow Lab. And this is sort of uh, interesting to point out. So the main Super CDMS experiment uh, that's gonna take place at Snow Lab. So here I'm showing one of the detectors. So they put six of these detectors in a single tower. But what you notice is that here's the detector, and then of course there's lots of copper around it. But what you notice is that there's this little black material that's actually some material called Solex, and that can um, produce Cherenkov radiation. And it turns out that you know no material is perfect, and and these have impurities in them. These these materials, um, despite the best efforts, you know, of making them as pure as possible. But those materials will have about fifty thousand beta decays per year, where that can produce Cherenkov radiation. Now, many of them will be easily vetoed, many of these strength of photons that can produce an electron or a couple of electrons, but it's not clear how many. And we need a you know, careful simulation is needed to, to figure out how important this background is uh, for super CMS. Now, um, as I alluded to very briefly, the chunk of radiation or the radio recommendation, the recommendation can also produce uh, photons that are sub-EV, which can be a background to propose low threshold phonon detectors. One thing that's fun to point out is that there's actually been a correlation between the observed coherence times of superconducting qubits and the environmental radiation. So what we are hypothesizing here is that the same kind of backgrounds that the lowest threshold direct detection community is sensitive to will also affect building quantum computers, right? Building superconducting qubits. So this, is a, um, this has implications well beyond dark matter. Uh, now, the fortunate thing is you can mitigate a lot of these backgrounds and for example, for Oscura, we're going to have a shield that's much, 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 much better than what we have uh, for the, the shield that we had at, at Sensei at Minos. So those backgrounds will be far reduced, those strength of backgrounds, just because the tracks are far reduced as well. And I've got some other um, mitigation strategies that I have in the backup if someone is interested. Now, there's a lot of, so this is, this is I think, very important progress. It, tells us that it makes sense to build these experiments because we do have mitigation strategies now that we've identified these backgrounds. Um, so better shielding is useful. Um, you know, reduced number of dielectric materials is useful. Um, so all this is very useful, but there's still big mysteries in terms of you know, a lot of the other data that exists. And there was just a workshop actually yesterday and today called Excess, where people have talked about all the various excesses that exist also at other experiments. So, and those have a different origin than what I'm talking about here. So there's still lots of stuff to figure out. Okay. So as promised, I will not get to the third topic. So I'll just go to the summaries, uh, the summary quickly. So there's been significant theory and experimental progress, which I've just tried to very briefly summarize in, in, in just a few highlights uh, for probing low mass direct, for probing low mass dark matter, many detection concepts with various targets, we have improved calculations for dark matter scattering, for example, in crystals, uh, but those calculations are getting improved in various systems. And we have now several experiments that can now probe small dark matter signals. Um, and also we've, the, the, the thing I said in the last 10 minutes, we have improved understanding of low energy backgrounds, at least some of them with wide ranging positive implications. So this really tells us that, you know, understanding these backgrounds allow, allows us to mitigate them and also build up the, build the big experiments. Thanks very much. Thanks for a very nice talk. Um, any questions? Yes, Mariana. Um, thank you for a great talk. Uh, can you go back to the slide which you have projected limits for uh, all the different uh, experiments? I was just curious, it looks like the mass uh, difference between uh, Sensei Minus and the projected 100 gram was really significantly bigger than between Sensei and Oscura because you have what uh, two grams now, so it's a 50, 50, about a factor of 50 difference. Oh, uh, so, the, the, the Sensei Minos, we don't, didn't, the, we didn't run it for a year. This was just, oh, month. okay, okay, so it's yeah, the runtime difference. It's just exposure, just yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so it's yeah. the runtime, it's not just the difference. Yeah, yeah I didn't uh, say that, okay. it's just the runtime, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, when going to substantially larger masses, would those actually be, uh, you know, really different sensors in this case, or just you just put more of them together? 
or is something that's in principle different? Naively, it's putting more together, but the challenges that come with it are that you, the electronics, right? So instead of reading out one sensor, uh, and you know, in the sensor scuba CCD, we, we have uh, four amplifiers or so four readouts. Uh, but if you have, if for sensor 100 gram, we need 50 sensors. And then if you go to 10 kilogram, right, you've got, uh, for, you know, 5,000, right? Um, so that makes it much more challenging, the, the readout. And also the background is very important, the background control. So, you know, for example, the stuff I talked about, you need to really have an amazing shield, uh, have super pure materials um, for a Skura, whereas in Sensei, just the 100 gram year exposure, we can be much more, you know, loose in terms of, uh, we, do, we can be much less careful, if you like, about um, our material handling and so on. So it gets progressively more challenging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Please click the raise hand button, then I can give you a mic. Well, I was a little curious actually. Um, is the do you think the sensor detector will be sensitive to the any kind of modulation like annual modulation? Yeah, good question. So uh, we we so our exposure plus readout takes you know depends how we run, but in in this data that produced this limit here, we basically expose the CCD for twenty hours and then read it out read it out for five hours. It's very slow readout because every pixel gets sampled multiple times. Uh, but certainly we can look for animal modulation, right? We can look for a variation over the year time scale. Um, so yes, the answer is yes, right? The quick answer. Mm -hmm. uh, what I was going to talk about briefly in, in the third topic that I didn't get to as expected um, was to look for diurnal modulation. So we can even look for um, daily modulation by just taking shorter readouts, short, short exposures and readouts. So that we can do. So sense in general, we don't have great timing information because the CC gets exposed and then we take a long time. But you know, things that are bought a day or certainly about a month or a year, we can easily look for timing. We can easily look for the modulation there. I see, great. Yeah, we, we would do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if there is no more question, well, well, thanks again, Ruben, for the nice talk. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. So maybe you can move on to the next speaker. Gustavo Marcos Tavares, are you there? Oh, great. Hey, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, great, good to see you. <laughs> so, would you put your slides on? Sure, let me see. Um, can, can you see the slides? Yeah, perfect. So, okay. great. So, uh, next speaker is uh, Gustavo from University of Maryland. Please. Okay. Uh, yeah, first I want to uh, thank the organizers very much for the invitation to speak in this great conference. And I guess also to take time so that we could still talk at a reasonable time uh, here in, on the East Coast. And Today, I want to tell you a little bit about work that I've been doing with Melissa Diamond, who is a very good graduate student from Johns Hopkins, about new ideas to search for dark sectors using uh, neutron star mergers. And first, I just want to sort of situate us, uh, at least the way I see the current era in particle physics. I think we've really entered uh, a fully exploratory era in particle physics in the sense that we we don't have a very clear target in terms of energy scale or, or, or coupling for where the new discovery is going to be. So, so we have to make sure we're casting a very wide net. But at the same time, we have many, many questions uh, about fundamental physics that have not been answered by the standard model. And so we know that there is uh, physics beyond the standard model. And, and our job is to try to figure out how to explore this, this sort of vast territory of, of sort of model space. And in doing this, this exploration, I think it's useful to project our, our, our search in, in sort of a two-dimensional plane in which there are two main axes. One is, is energy, which is just uh, saying that we can probe uh, for, for new physics by going to higher and higher energies. 
which has been a very successful program at Colliders, and, and there are many proposed ways in which we're going to continue pushing in that direction. But uh, another equally important direction is just uh, sort of simplified here is as coupling space, which is just increasing our sensitivity to the energy skills that we already have access to with, with current experiments. And it's very nice that the previous two talks by Mariana and Ruben were, were exactly touching on this aspect of sort of, they were looking for degrees of freedom that are uh, in, in many cases lighter than a GV or much lighter than a GV and just developing technology that you can go to much lower couplings. And, and there has been a lot of uh, sort of increased, increased activity in this direction of going to low couplings, partly motivated by experimental developments but also by sort of new theoretical ideas that have shown that, that some of the questions that we thought required physics above the weak scale can actually be addressed by, by light fields. Um, and so it really has pushed our motivation to search for low coupling. And when you're sort of an explorer uh, trying to map an uh, uncharted territory, it's incredibly useful when you get access to a new tool. And this is what has happened to us in recent years in which uh, with the developments of, of, of gravitational wave detectors, we now can see the universe with a completely different, uh, through a completely different messenger, which are gravitational waves. And so now that we have this new tool, which uh, is very powerful because gravitational waves can travel long distances without uh, interacting with anything. And so they can carry very detailed information. Um, I think it's a great time to be thinking, how can we use uh, gravitational waves as a probe of new physics? And there are already many ideas that people have explored, some of which have been discussed in this, in this conference, such as sort of looking for phase transitions in the early universe or cosmic strings, or trying to look at the effect of new long range forces, or there are a number of different uh, dynamics of actions that can also uh, give rise to interesting gravitational waves. But what I want to explore today is, is a new idea, which is to show how uh, we can actually use uh, gravitational waves as a new probe of MEV scale dark sectors. And, and so this is what I want to focus on today. It's uh, this sort of new, new way to use gravitational waves for, for this very specific reason. And what I'm going to use is a little bit more than just uh, gravitational waves. I, I actually will advocate to use a multi-messenger astronomy approach to search for dark sectors in which you combine information from gravitational wave probes with electromagnetic signals that are also associated with the same event. And um, just to, as a reminder, if you, if you don't really remember, here on the left, I'm showing the plot of uh, the first multi-messenger detector, multi detection that we've had, that we've made with gravitational waves, which was a neutron star merger that LIGO uh, and Virgo saw. And here you can see sort of the gravitational wave signal as this green curve uh, increasing frequency as it approaches the merger. And then uh, above you see these three curves, which are uh, gamma ray detectors. And you can see that uh, they have a common time. And you see that about two seconds after the merger, those detectors saw uh, a burst of gamma rays uh, that was fairly detectable above background. And, um, and so, so that, that inaugurated a new area in which we can do multi-messenger astronomy now using gravitational waves. And uh, it really remains to be seen how much we can use this uh, as, a, as a probe of, of physics beyond the standard model. And as maybe motivation and, and, and also as uh, maybe just showing how powerful these types of combinations can be. It's good to remember that, that we've had multi-messenger probes, uh, we've had multi-messenger probes in astronomy for a while now where we can search for both photons and neutrinos. And the fact that we saw both from the supernova that went off in 1987 in the large Magellanic cloud allowed us, uh, especially because we measured the spectrum of the neutrinos, allowed us to put very, very stringent bounds on a number of, of uh, physics beyond the standard model scenarios uh, involving light degrees of freedom. So, so some of the strongest bounds that we have uh, came from, from using this multi-messenger astronomy probe. So here's a little sort of summary and also outline for uh, what I wanna tell you about today. So first I want to tell you why neutron star mergers are, are a good place to search for dark sectors, essentially why they're uh, a place where you can actually produce a lot of dark sector particles. And then, um, but 
the one thing to keep in mind is that neutron star mergers that we see are going to be very far away, sort of at cosmological distances. And so the, the signal will get, uh, even though you can produce a lot of them, there will be uh, a dilution just because it's so far away. And, and so directly seeing the dark sector particles, given their small couplings, is, is not the most promising direction. But as long as there are some uh, unstable particles in the dark sector, uh, those, when, once they decay, they can produce uh, electromagnetic signals. And, and so this electromagnetic signal is what we're going to be searching for. So, so really the, the sort of the plan is to use gravitational waves to tell us uh, and give us time information about a neutron star merger and also some uh, localization information and then search for subsequent uh, electromagnetic events that are following up the merger. So, so th this will be the signal. And uh, so, ju and now just to put things into perspective, I want to specialize to a specific kind of dark sector. But but first, let me just uh, describe uh, one definition of dark sector. Uh, I gather there are slightly there are variations on how people define a dark sector. But for me, I'll just take a dark sector to be a collection of new particles which are not charged under any of the standard model gauge uh, groups. And so the the way that because they're not charged under the center model gauge groups, it can only talk to the center model through uh, gauge invariant operators of the standard model, coupled to operators in the dark sector. And the, the, in, in many models, sort of the, the, the generic expectation is that the largest couplings are going to be the ones that are given by the renormalizable portals, from which there are three main portals. There is a vector, a scalar, and a Fermi portal. So, so there are just a few possibilities. And the idea that, that I'm proposing could really be applied to, to any of them, but for simplicity, uh, and also because it's sort of uh, one that has already appeared many times in this conference, I'll, I'll focus on the vector portal, which I think is sort of the, the one in which the signal is very clear. And the vector portal is, is also known as, as the dark photon, which is uh, a new spin one uh, field, which has a mass. and it has a small kinetic mixing with our photon. So, so essentially the, the way that this dark photon interacts with us is because it can mix a little bit with our photon. So anything that, that has electromagnetic couplings will get an induced small coupling to the dark photon through this mixing, right? So in, in particular electrons and any, any other kind of charged lepton. And I'll focus on the case where the main decay of the dark photon is back to the standard model which is what you expect, for example, if the dark photon is lighter than other dark sector states, or uh, if the coupling that it has to other dark sector states are small. So, so it's a fairly generic situation. Okay, so, so this is the model that I'm gonna focus on. And the, the reason, I mean, besides being one of the renormalizable portals to the dark sector, another reason why the dark photon is a sort of an extremely well-studied model is because it also provides a very uh, good way to produce dark matter in the early universe. So, so if you assume that the dark matter lives in that dark sector that I was describing, and its main interaction with us is through the dark photon, then the, this interaction mediated by the dark photon can explain the abundance of dark matter in the early universe. But for that to be true, you, you need the coupling to be large enough that, that you produce at least the amount of dark matter that we see today. If you produce more, then, then you can have additional dynamics inside the dark sector that would deplete this abundance. And uh, for example, I, I know that in Josh's talk yesterday, he, he covered a lot of different ways in, in which you can do this. But uh, just requiring that you produce at least the, mean, the, the amount that we see today gives you a target, like a minimum coupling that you need to be able, uh, that you need to have in order to produce enough dark matter. And that's in the ballpark of 10 to the minus 11. So, so there's very small kinetic mixing. And here on the left, it's sort of, uh, I mean, from a few years ago, but, but it's still more or less, I mean, there, there are a few small new developments, but it's mostly still up to date. It's the parameter space of the dark photon model uh, when it's visibly decaying. And everything in gray has already been excluded by different experiments. And um, there are a variety of accelerator experiments and beam dump experiments. And as you go to very small couplings, uh, you get to this SN here that I don't know if you can read, which stands for supernova. So, so it's just to say that for very, very small couplings, 
even the, the sort of very, very high luminosity beam dump type experiments run out of steam and they don't have enough statistics to produce uh, enough dark photons, but, but then you can use astrophysical sources as the next uh, place that you can search because they, they can really be very efficient sources. And then here, just to note that it's epsilon squared, so, so, so it's not quite close to 10 to the minus 11 yet. And, uh, and, and all of those colored curves are just projected experiments that you see are, are trying to fill this gap here in, in which we don't have coverage yet. And, and the reason why there is this gap is just because the, the experiments that live up here are making use of prompt decays of the dark photon, while for the experiments that show up at lower couplings require the dark photon to be long lived. And, and so that's why there's a gap uh, connecting those two, even though you would expect that it's always easier to see things when they have larger couplings. And as you, you'll see that this will show up again uh, in my talk. And so if I just zoom in in this very low, low coupling regime, which is where I'm trying to uh, go to, to reach this, this dark matter target of 10 to the minus 11, you see that there is the, the supernova bounds that are coming from just cooling arguments of the supernova, which cover uh, a good amount of parameter space, but they end at around 10 to the minus nine or so kinetic mixing. And then there are some newer bounds that, that I proposed with uh, these excellent collaborators down here which make use of the visible decays of the dark photon and can cover some of the parameter space down here. And again, you see that there are some gaps. And the reason why there are gaps is again, because the, those probes that we had here required the dark photon to be sufficiently long lived because the, the supernova has a huge, is, a, is coming from a big star and, and the signal required the dark photon to be able to be produced in the core and then escape the star before it decays. And so what, what we want to do now with the neutron star mergers is to cover the remaining uh, parameter space that we couldn't cover with the supernovas and maybe extend also to higher masses. Okay, so now let me start telling you why the neutron star mergers are actually a useful target. I, I mean, why are they a promising place to produce dark factor particles? And it's really because they are sort of remarkable places in the universe. Uh, the merger of neutron stars, so you take each neutron star has more than the solar mass, and, but it's extremely compact. It's just about 10 kilometers. And so the density in the neutron star is huge. It, it's about 100 MeV to the fourth. So, so it's really uh, QCG type density. So that's about 14 orders of magnitude more dense than a typical object on Earth. And at the end of the merger, they, their orbital velocity is approaching the speed of light. So, so you have this incredibly massive thing that, that is more, more than a solar mass, and they're heading towards each other with almost relativistic speeds. So, so there's a lot of kinetic energy. And, and once they, they merge, a lot of this kinetic energy is transferred into heat. And so you get this very, very dense region, which is now also very hot, so, which is this remnant that, that, that appears once they, the merger goes on. It can reach tens of MeV. So, so you have a region that has a densities that are, that are huge, that are much, much higher than anything you could hope to get on Earth with temperatures that are in the tens of MeV. So, so that's why it's a very, very promising source of MeV scale dark factors. And this, this remnant that, that is formed when, when they, they collide can live for a relatively long time, sort of things that, that range between 10 to 1,000 milliseconds uh, before it collapses into a black hole, which is the most likely outcome for most mergers. Uh, and then some mergers, if, if the stars that are involved in the merger are a little bit lighter, they can even form a new stable, heavier neutron star. And here uh, I'm just taking uh, from this, this paper uh, a snapshot of a few simulations just to show you uh, what I just said in words. So as you can see, uh, this is a snapshot a few milliseconds after the merger. And as you can see, there is a, a region of sort of order 10 kilometers in which the densities are, are very, very large, above 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cubed. And then the outer edges of this region, which are also sort of order five or so kilometers, reach temperatures in the tens of MeV. And so, so this is why th this hot and dense region are, 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 is the promising source of dark factor particles. Okay, so of course the, the, the exact form, I mean, there's still a lot of improvements that are being done to this kind of simulation, but just to give you a proof, proof of principle that this is a very promising direction, a, a very uh, 
in that there is a robust signature that we can search for. I'll take a very, very simplified model of the remnant. I'll take the remnant to be just a spherical shell. So I only take the outer part of the, this remnant and I'll take it to be about five kilometers and with this parameters here. So, so about 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cubed, I'll take a temperature of 30 MeV, which is sort of on the lower end of what a lot of the simulations give us, and then uh, a proton fraction of about 10%. And then on the right here is just showing sort of the evolution of the, the maximum temperature and maximum density for a couple of different simulations. And, and just to show you that, that the, the remnant can live for sort of 10 to uh, many, many, many milliseconds. And as you can see, you can easily reach temperatures that are well above 30 MeV. Okay, so, so now that we have uh, a model of, of the remnant, uh, we can actually compute the production of dark, dark photons inside of this remnant. And the dominant production channel, and so the only, and the only one that I'll consider is just proton neutron scattering with a bremming of a dark photon. So, so because there's a very, very large number, number density of protons and neutrons, and, and they have very large nuclear cross sections, this, this, this two to three process is actually very efficient. So here we computed the instantaneous luminosity for a kinetic mixing parameter of 10 to the minus 10. And as you can see, it, you produce a very, very large instantaneous luminosity of dark photons, something that's ranging from about 10 to the 49 uh, to more than 10 to the 50 ergs per second. And if you're not used to astro, uh, astronomical units, like erg is about a TeV. And so just to give you a sense of how bright this is, because uh, I mean, when you get to these large numbers, maybe you don't have a, a very good sense of what this means. Um, a supernova, the, the energy that goes in a car collapse supernova that goes into uh, visible light, it's about 10 to the 51 ergs, but that's spread over many months. So the instantaneous luminosity is way lower than this. And for example, that gamma ray burst that, that was associated with the neutron star merger in 2017, the, the peak luminosity of that is expected to have been about 10 to the 47 Earth. So you see that even um, the, the dark photon luminosity that we get here is, is a couple of orders of magnitude above even uh, the one from, from that other neutron star merger that, that we saw a couple of years ago. Of course, I mean, that's the luminosity in dark photons, uh, but we cannot see the dark photons directly. So, so what we really care about is how much of that energy goes into visible, uh, into the visible sector, and what is the spectrum of the energy that goes into the visible sector. And to answer that question, we need to understand the, what happens uh, to the dark photon after it decays. So what happens to the energy once the dark photon decays, right? So here's a little cartoon of what would go on in the central hot region here. You produce a lot of dark photons. They travel a very large distance. So, so here's just giving you an idea. They travel thousands uh, to uh, almost a million kilometers before they decay. And then once they decay, they decay to electrons and positrons. And that forms a, a relativistic plasma, a relativistic expanding plasma of, of uh, which is relatively dense. And in order to describe the evolution of this plasma, it, it's useful to actually go to the, to the frame that's co-expanding with the plasma such that in sort of in your local frame, you, you have an isotropic distribution of, of momenta for the electrons and positrons. And so you can define temperature and things like that more. Uh, in a more useful sense. And, and if you go to a co-expanding frame, it's easy to convince yourself that, that the temperature of that co-expanding frame, at least initially, will be just given by the mass of the dark photon, right? Because if you imagine the, the co-expanding frame is something that would be traveling at the same speed of the dark photon before it decays. And so it just sees the, the energy that was stored in the dark photon mass going into ele electrons and positrons. So, so you get some temperature that's order few MeV because we're interested in MeV scale uh, dark photons. However, because the decay distance is so large, the density is much, much less than MeV cubed. So, so the, the number density of, of leptons will be much less than T cubed. So you have a relatively under dense plasma compared to what you would get if the plasma was in full chemical equilibrium, okay? And there will be three important processes actually, essentially that, that uh, describe the evolution of this plasma. One is just the relativistic expansion. And the main feature of the, the, the expansion is that it's a expanding gas of relativistic particles. And what the, that does is that it takes the energy density of that plasma 
and through this this expansion the energy density dilutes as the radius of the of the shell to the fourth power right similarly to what happens in the early universe the the other process that's important is the annihilation of the leptons into photons and of course this is important because we want to see photons but what happens is that as long as the density is sufficiently high, this process can be very, very quick, the annihilation into photons, but it also means that the inverse process, the pair creation is also uh, efficient. And so that, that actually brings the two number densities, the electron and the photon number densities to be related by detailed balance. So, so you, just, you just get this process to enter equilibrium. And then the third process that is also very important is Bram's Strahlung. And the reason why Bram's Strahlung is important is that if you look at annihilation, you change the number density of electrons, but you don't change the total number density of particles in the gas, right? You take two leptons and you trade it for two photons. So, so still the total number of particles in the plasma remains fixed. But bram strahlung actually can increase that number. And so you, you can take two electrons and go to two electrons plus a photon. And because, as I said, the number density is, is fairly dilute compared to what you would expect from chemical equilibrium, what this process tries to do is that it tries to increase the number density towards the chemical equilibrium distribution. So that makes it makes the number density try to go towards a, a T cubed value. But again, because you have a total number, of, I mean, the total energy in the, in the plasma is fixed, if you're increasing the number of particles in the gas, the average energy has to go down. And so that also decreases the temperature. So that's why Bram's problem is very important. It both increases the total number of particles, but it also decreases the average energy of each particle. Okay, and uh, today I'll only focus on, on the part of the parameter space in which both of those processes are efficient because it just makes for a much simpler signal because essentially you, you get uh, effective thermalization in the plasma. So what happens if both of both of those processes are, are efficient? And, and by efficient, I just mean that their their rates are much faster than the expansion rate of the plasma. Is that uh, you start producing more and more photons because of the bram strahlung and that the temperature starts to decrease. bram strahlung uh, is because you just have more and more particles around for you to scatter, and that happens up until the temperature reaches the mass of the electron. At that point, uh, the electron number density starts to be Boltzmann suppressed as expected. And so you start, to lose, uh, you start to lose number density of charged states. But without the charged states, you don't actually get any scattering. And so eventually what happens is that the photons can just escape that plasma. And they escape once the, the temperature drops a factor of a few be below the, the mass of the electron. And because this is an exponential process, it typically, as long as you, you decrease the temperature by a factor of around 10 or so, uh, all of the other processes will shut down. And what that tells you is that uh, the photons will escape once the average energy is close to sort of tens of keV. And so irrespective of the initial details, you'll get a signal uh, which is a lot of photons so most of the energy will go to photons, which is good because we can see the photons, and they will be at energies in the ballpark of 100 keV. Okay, so, so here I can uh, show you some of our results, um, and uh, it's a relatively complicated plot. And the first thing is I want to emphasize that this is not uh, supposed to be seen as an exclusion plot or, 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 or something like this, because there's still a lot that we need to improve. It, it's about, sort of roughly the expected sensitivity that we think we'll have to this processes. And so let me guide you here. The, this region in red that I, we call fireball is just the region of parameter space in which you get this thermalization. So, so that's the region in which you produce, once the dark photon decays, the plasma that it produces is dense enough that, that you get efficient annihilation and you get efficient bram strahlung so, so you get this thermal spectrum. So, and so in all of this red region, you get essentially that all of the energy that was in, in dark photons to good approximation will go into photons and that, that those photons will be uh, with the temperature of effective temperature of the spectrum of those photons will be uh, order 100 keV or a little bit less. This purple curve here that we call GBM signal, this is uh, roughly the luminosity. That, so th in this parameter space, the luminosity that you will get uh, if converted into photons, is, is enough such that the gamma ray burst, the gamma ray burst monitor at the Fermi satellite could actually see the signal. And so, very, very roughly, what you would expect is that anything that's above the purple line 
and is also colored in red, should be fairly easy for, for the current gamma ray detectors that we have to see this signal. So, so that's sort of our prime, uh, prime target, at least for, for this easier part of the, the thermal part of the spectrum. And uh, just to emphasize here, we assume that the remnant lives only for 10 milliseconds, which is sort of on the lower end of what is expected the rem the, for the remnant to, to survive. We can also consider what would happen if the remnant lives for a whole second, which is sort of on the high end of, of, of what could, could happen. And, and would, for example, be the case if we're lucky enough that we see two relatively light neutron stars uh, merging. And then you see that we can probably probe uh, in the region sort of above 100, and, uh, below 100 MeV in mass, we can probe almost all of the, the freezing uh, dark matter region that I discussed. Right, and so, so it really greatly enhances the, the sensitivity. Okay, so, so as I said again, th those plots are only meant to be what is the region in which we get a large enough signal that we should be able to see it. But uh, in order for this to actually become uh, a projection of discovery or, uh, or of constraints, there are a couple things that we need to, to still improve. One is that uh, there will be background. And, and one important background is, is as I show, showed in the very beginning of the talk, we actually saw a burst of gamma rays following a neutron star merger. So, so we need to be able to distinguish the signal that comes from a dark photon from a more ordinary type of gamma ray burst. And there are a couple of different features that, that we are confident can be used to, to distinguish the two, but, but there's still a little bit of uh, things that we need to understand to, to, to get uh, the uncertainties correctly. So, so one of the things that you can use is that get normal gamma ray bursts, that they come from uh, jets that are formed once, once the remnant uh, collapses into a black hole, in falling matter ends up forming a jet, and then this jet can emit very, very bright radiation. But because it's a jet, the radiation that it emits is very beamed in the direction of the jet. And so the the these gamma ray bursts are highly anisotropic. And so if you see many, many mergers, you expect that only a few times you would get the bright signal. And most of the time, the jet would not be pointing towards us. And then you would get either a very dim or no signal at all. The other thing that can be used is also that our spectrum, at least in this red region, will be thermal, while the, the gamma ray burst signal from, from jets is, is, is not highly non-thermal. Okay, and then uh, another thing that we still need to, to, to work a little bit more to improve is that we use a very simplified model for the, the remnant. So in order to actually turn this current sort of sensitivity uh, region into, into more robust uh, predictions, we need to actually get better, uh, better predictions for the signal coming from more realistic remnant modeling. So, so we, need, we need to get uh, data from, from actual simulations and then see how much variation there is between the different simulations. And so with that, I just want to uh, conclude and, and discuss a little bit of future outlook. So I hope that I've convinced you that the neutron star mergers are a promising place to search for, for dark sectors. I, I focused on dark photons, but really the only thing that, that is, uh, I think, very important is that you have something that can decay back to standard model. And, and that has uh, sort of, and as you can see, even very small couplings are enough for you to produce a very, very large luminosity of, of that new, new particle. With, uh, with future data, so, so when we have more statistics of neutron star mergers so that we can try to more carefully distinguish uh, the signal from ordinary gamma ray bursts, we should probably be able to probe most of the, the remaining dark matter freezing uh, region in which the dark matter interaction with us that causes freezing is through a dark photon with a mass in the ballpark of one to 100 MeV. And one thing that sort of is a little bit more futuristic, but it's very exciting and probably will help us uh, go even uh, lower in, in sensitivity is that uh, in the future, I mean, currently LIGO can only see the very end of the, the binary neutron star merger. So it can only see the last uh, tens of seconds of the, of the merger right before it merges. So that's not enough time for it to give out a, a warning for something to point in. If you want to see a signal that's going to be almost instantaneous with the merger, you need to have to get warning much, much before just a few, few seconds. 
But in the future, we'll get gravitational wave detectors that can see into lower frequencies. So, so they'll be able to give you warnings with days or even months ahead, saying that in some re and, and that will also give you better localization. So, so it will be able to tell in this location in the sky, in this amount of time, there will be a merger. And so you can actually point more sensitive detectors uh, that, that have much uh, narrower field of view to that area. Because currently we're using things like the gamma, uh, the gamma ray burst monitor, which is a third of the sky, because well, we need to be sensitive. We need to be seeing the same region where, where the neutron star merger happened. But, uh, but of course, that also greatly increases the background because it's seeing gamma rays coming from a third of the universe. So, so if you can see narrower field of view, uh, you can actually go down to much, much lower sensitivities. And, and we think that sort of once we go away from the thermal region where, where not all of the energy is going to go into photons, it will be very important to be able to see give this, uh, this trigger warning beforehand so that you can point more sensitive detectors to, to, towards the merger. So yeah, this is all I wanted to tell you today. And uh, thank you again for the, for the opportunity to talk and I'll be happy to take questions. Great, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, questions? Yes, Mariana. Uh, hello, thank you for a very interesting talk. Could you talk a little bit more about distinguishing uh, that uh, this signal from the just gamma rays burst standard model signal? Because this is really not well understood either. Because for example, that only merger where the signal was seen, the gamma ray burst was much weaker. And uh, actually it's surprising that we've seen it at all. Uh, so would there be difference in duration, for example, and, and timing with uh, kind of expected gamma ray bursts? Yeah, good. So, so I yeah, there, there's still a lot of uncertainties and, and, and that, that's why, but, but I think that there's still this expectation that sort of at least from, from talking to other neutron star merger uh, experts, they said, for example, I mean, we, we cannot tell from just the gravitational wave signal, the, the inclination, there's, there's a large degeneracy between different parameters, but apparently they, they can tell if, if something was edge on, so, so that sort of if the, the plane of the, of the merger was in the line of sight to us. And I think in that case, you would get almost nothing from the jet just because you're essentially 90 degrees away from the jet uh, versus uh, getting something that, that is heads on. So, so I think th that is one thing that, that you can use, but, but exactly how much the luminosity decreases as you move away from the angle of the jet is, is, is actually not understood. I think there are different models and they predict slightly different things. Then there is the spectrum in which for us, the spectrum would look very thermal, while for, for the gamma ray burst, the, the spectrum is, is, is very non-thermal because it's expected to, to come from, from shocks in, in uh, traveling in the jet when they collide with each other and things like this. And then for, for parts of the parameter space, you can also use signal duration. So, so for us, I mean, one thing that I didn't talk about, but is that essentially the, the, the duration of the signal for us is, will be will be related to the lifetime of the, the original dark photon because that, that gives you the, the thickness of the, the, the initial shell. And the, essentially the thickness of the initial shell is, is all you need to, to, to determine the duration of the signal. So uh, in a sense, funnily enough, the, the, the region towards the edge where, where you, you get less signal, the, the signal is also going to last for longer. So, so it might actually be easier to, to distinguish those from the ones in which the decays, uh, in which you have a brighter signal, but the decay is very short because the, the gamma ray burst that they see lasted about 0.1 seconds. And, and I think 0.1 seconds is something sort of uh, in, in roughly where my mouth is passing through because uh, I know that this do not escape is we put a cut that we, we required the, the decay to be at least a thousand kilometers because we wanted to avoid complications of decaying too close to the merger. So just for simplicity, we put in this, this cutoff of a thousand kilometers, this 10 to the minus like a 10, 10 milliseconds. And so about a factor of, of three away of that in coupling is when you, when you would have uh, order hundred milliseconds, which which what they saw. So as long as you're further away from here, the duration could also be used to distinguish the signal. Thank but, you. but I think it will need to be this multi-pronged. I think you'll need to get information for, for all from all three angles, from duration, from, statistics of, of how this, how much variability you're seeing, like let's say you, you see the signal a couple of times, then uh, if, if there's not much variation in the luminosity, 
and then also from the spectrum. I think you'll need all three probes to actually be able to say something with more confidence. More questions? We can collect the raise hand button and I can give you a speaker, I mean the mic. Well, I was actually a little curious that, um, I mean, I think you already showed the plot and I missed the plot or something, but uh, there was a um, neutron star merger a few years back detected by LIGO, right? It's a, could you, I think you showed only the sensitivity plot of the future event, but uh, could you make the plot of the exclusion plot from that event a few years back? So, so I mean, uh, uh, we purposely didn't want to do an exclusion plot from, from that event for, for, for a couple of different reasons. I mean, w one, I don't want to claim exclusion of something that I'm not very confident is excluded because I don't want to prevent people looking. And, and there is currently too much uncertainty because as I was saying, it, it's not easy to distinguish. I mean, for example, we saw a gamma ray burst associated with that event. And um, there was some, some part of the contribution actually looked a little bit thermal. So, so that thing could be coming from a dark photon. But as I said, our prediction is still has a large uncertainty to it. And it's currently, I think with a single event, you cannot distinguish a gamma ray burst that's coming from a standard model type process from this jet formation, which still has large uncertainties from, from something coming from BSM. So, so I think um, that's why I think you would need to, to see a few events in order to see if uh, so some of the features that I was discussing, specifically if the, if the luminosity is only correlated with distance, which is what would happen for us because our signal is fairly isotropic versus something that's coming from a jet, which would depend on the inclination of the jet with respect to us, it would depend very sensitively on that uh, and, and not just on the distance. So, so if you start to, see, and, and LIGO tells us distance, which is very good. So, so you can use just this distance versus luminosity of gamma ray burst signals to try to distinguish between the two scenarios. But with a single one, you cannot do it. So, so it's something that's more, we, we will need a couple, we'll need more statistics and also we'll need uh, to work a little bit harder on our side of the prediction to make sure exactly what are the best handles to distinguish the two signals, which is something we're, we're doing now. I see. Fair enough. And a uh, uh, question from Colin. Yeah. Um, hi. hi. How, about, how about a case there will be new observation of the neutron star without gamma ray signal, will you consider that, or will you consider set a limit for that? Yeah, so, so I think if there, uh, if there is a neutron star merger without any gamma ray signal, then I think you can put constraints, which I mean, I guess I'm more interested in the discovery than constraints, but with one caveat, which I think is something that, that I mean, in the future, this caveat will be gone, but, but is you could have, uh, there are scenarios in which the, depending on the equation of state of the neutron star and also on the mass of the progenitors. So if, the, if they're very massive, the two neutron stars merging, that it could collapse to a black hole almost instantaneously within a few milliseconds. And so this is one way in which maybe you could evade the balance. Of course, I think people are working very hard on improving their simulation. And um, so, so again, I think a single event, you could always think that maybe that was one of the cases in which it collapsed too quickly. Uh, but most of the case, most of the time, we don't expect it to collapse so quickly because it, it has a lot of angular momentum that it inherits from the the, the the binary from the orbit, and that makes it matter stable for for a few milliseconds. So, so I think if you see a few events, a few mergers without any gamma ray signal, then I think you could probably put a fairly conservative bound on on a large part of the parameter space. Thank you. Sure. Any more questions? Okay, so this year on the schedule. So uh, thank you again, Gustavo. And, uh, okay. and uh, on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank everyone I and mean, all the speakers in this session, Mariana, Ruben, and Gustavo. I think it was very exciting topic and very nice talk. So uh, we are gonna end the session now and we'll have about 30 minutes break before the parallel session. So thank you and talk today. All right.